40 minutes of questions sitting here. I've got 40 minutes of time with the chairman, so I'm going to go to the next speaker, and then I may ask you if some of you would be willing, either voluntarily or under a UC motion, to cut our times down to three minutes so I can get everybody in. Mr. Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member. Kind of curious order we're going in this morning, but I have uh, more questions than I have time. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to get into some specifics as it relates to California's water issue. Uh, I find it somewhat uh, saddening that some of our colleagues here in the committee uh, continue to um, think that uh, growing food is a less of importance and, and using um, farmers and farm workers as political football is uh, and, and kicking them in the teeth is somehow uh, appropriate. But nonetheless, I will continue to try to solve uh, and fix some of the broken water problems we have in California. To that end, we had a bipartisan piece of legislation that you're familiar with, the WIN Act, that was passed. Uh, it's uh, got a five-year window in terms of its implementation. Uh, the idea being simply to use greater flexibility when we have water moving through the system <clears throat> without violating existing uh, environmental uh, uh, law to move more water through the system um, for the state. Under current rainfall in California, can you speak to the specifics of how Reclamation intends to implement the flexibility provided in this act? Well, yeah, we have uh, put additional funds in the WIND Act, and I've always found it actually somewhat ironic because they always talk about the rich Republican farmers, but they're being represented by a poor Democrat legislator. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the, yeah, and wa water is a serious issue. Uh, it's the there, farmers they, and the farm workers and the communities that put food on America's dinner table every night. Absolutely, and quite frankly, much of the debate in the central issue is internal between California. I've always found it as a, as a, as the federal water, uh, sometimes referee. I'm refereeing water that begins in California, ends in California, is used in California. And there's never a scenario where the federal government's gonna win in this. So is your notion or the conversation we had previously about uh, returning federal projects within a watershed totally within a state uh, to, to return those to states? I have talked to the governor about it and we're willing to discuss it. Uh, I understand when you have basins and they go multiple state, uh, why that? Why a, a federal government needs yeah. to be the fair referee? Yeah. Well, as I told you, that's not a new idea, and it's uh, it has merit, uh, but it also has a lot of controversy, like everything else in California. Uh, I'm not sure it's more controversial water. than within what I deal with every day. Uh, <laughs> uh, in Interior's district. budget does it provide enough resources to implement real-time monitoring of fish populations, so that now we've been getting water this week that we can pump more water uh, when endangered species are not present? I think it provides an adequate amount. You know, some of it is, again, the way we're organized between the different bureaus. Right, and we talked about that. And, and would you support legislation to put those uh, uh, purposes of NOAA and NIMPS from Commerce into the Department of Interior? And, and by the way, how well are you working with Commerce and NOAA and NIMPS? We work with them well. Uh, and I, you know, I'm on the record, and I haven't changed since as a congressman. I've always, I've always looked at, at Interior, the Forest Service, NIMFs. We need to either work together more close, closely and make a structural change to do that. And I'm not. I'm, so I'm you not, would consider supporting legislation that would make it more logical. We know the political reasons on how this evolved some 40 years ago. I, I would. I can tell you the the headwinds. A lot of it are over in the Senate. And no, it, has, I know. it has nothing yeah. to do with and dealing with, this with what's right. It's what who's in what committee. Both yeah. in Sacramento and now here in Washington. Let me uh, segue over. I mean, we, there, I'll submit some questions uh, and you can respond to it uh, for the record. But finally, um, uh, a lot of us were concerned with the proposed increased fees to cover the way overdue, and you mentioned it, maintenance efforts for our national parks. Um, uh, and, you know, while I don't represent Yosemite or Kings Canyon, they're in my backyard and I feel like it's a part of our area. Uh, those increases, I think, are very harmful to people who want to have access to the parks. I think we ought to be find a better way to put the money up front to deal with this deferred maintenance for all of our national parks, but obviously I'm focused on Yosemite and Kings Canyon, which I've known you visited. Well, and, and the proposals that are oftentimes in the news were just that. They were a series of proposals. We haven't made a decision yet. 
when we get to a draft, uh, no doubt the chairman, the ranking member on both, both House and, and Senate. And these belong to all Americans, and we want to make sure they're accessible and affordable. And I agree. I think the best value in America still is the year past, $80. Perhaps, dollars. A, perhaps America's greatest idea. As Great, as greatest said. idea. I'm not sure who pays for the parks with a wig. Everyone goes in for free. <laughs> Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. I'll try to do this within three minutes. Mr. Secretary, good to see you. Great to be with you at the uh, scouting report to the nation uh, event. You got it. Um, and thanks for coming to Pennsylvania last month. We uh, uh, really appreciate you being there to announce the 2018 uh, AML grants. Uh, you know, we've made great strides in restoring our historical mine lands over the past four decades, but there's a lot of scars left, uh, a lot more work to be done. Uh, the OSM estimates that the unfunded liabilities of the abandoned mine lands across the nation exceeds at least $10 billion, and that number continues to grow as more work is done. Now, I've been to a number of these reclamation sites in Pennsylvania, and the work is uh, impressive. Uh, it's helpful in restoring our lands, our waters, our communities, and, uh, and so obviously something that uh, we've got a lot more work to do. Can you discuss how the Office of Surface Mining plans to continue working with states and communities to restore abandoned mine lands, and especially in the uncertified states with the most needs? Abandoned, abandoned mines are an issue across, and oh, by, the, by the way, uh, both sides were invited to attend the public meeting when I went to Pennsylvania, and I think it's important for the Secretary to see it uh, and meet with lo local leaders, actually see it, and so there's a lot of, of work. In Pennsylvania, we see the lion's share of the AML for a reason, is that there's a lot of reclamation jobs that need to be done. Uh, we remain committed to the program. We think the, the program's good. Across this country, the way that we used to mine uh, was destructive. Oh, the modern mining techniques are a lot better, and we have a lot more regulation on it. But repairing the past mistakes still remains to be a prior priority in this budget. Yeah, I have the, uh, the largest, uh, or the, uh, I don't know if it's a privilege or a burden of having the most abandoned mine sites in my congressional district than any in the country. But we're very proud of the coal that we mined that uh, fueled the Industrial Revolution and helped win World War I and World War II. So we'll never, never apologize for that. Um, uh, just real quickly, is the Department or OSM considering any additional AML support for these states? Uh, we have a plus 51 uh, million on it, and we want to make sure the process of how we execute the funds, we think there's savings in that too. You know, analyzing when we give grants and money for this program, how is it being better spent or how could it be better spent to shorten the timeline? We think that will save money, which will allow us more flexibility and more programs. Actually make a bigger difference. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Sablon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome back uh, to the committee. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, the covenant that the agreement between the United States and the people of the Northern Marianas includes a the provision or language that says that the United States will help the Northern Marianas so that the lives and the communities will be uh, advanced to a state of a similar community in the United States. So last year, I uh, brought to your attention that under the uh, Office of Insular Affairs Competitive System for Covenant Funds, funds that were originally intended strictly for the Northern Marianas to promote that advancement of standard of living, um, all went to the Marianas. My district now gets less than half the money. This deprived Saipan, the only United States municipality without 24-hour potable water uh, of needed infrastructure funds. So in your written, written answer, you said that the competitive evaluation criteria are evaluated and revised as necessary every five years. Can you explain the revaluation process to me and what year it would next take place, please? Yeah, and I recognize that the territories are different. Uh, there are smaller communities, and there has been criticism, and some of it has been in the, in, the, in the IGs, that when we issue a grant, there's not transparency in how they're conducted or the standards are somewhat different. 
Uh, but I also understand that I think we're making the threshold of standards too stringent and not flexible enough. We all want transparency, but the territories themselves many times don't operate the same as the lower 48 or Alaska, and we need to be flexible and transparent, so we're looking at how to do that within Mr. the confines of the law. I, I, I don't want to disrespectfully cut you off, but my, if, you, if you want today, but can you explain, even in writing again, the revaluation process to me and what year it would next take place? Because five years, it's been over five years. My next question is, um, again, last year we discussed the long overdue Mariana Strengths National Mon Man Monument Management Plan that the Fish and Wildlife Service has been working on for nine years. In your written answer, you stated FWS continues to work with its partners towards completion of the plan and that a number of steps have been taken to address or resolve important issues such as 2016 patent under the Submerged Land Act. So can you tell me what has happened in the past year um, and when the draft monument management plan, which was to be completed in 2011 under President Bush's proclamation, when, when will it be issued? If, uh, a, a, a principal issue at the moment is science. Uh, the recommendation that went forward to the president about the monument was to allow commercial fishing. It is that we're trying to look at the science behind it. Uh, if you're going to allow commercial fishing, which is the most regulated industry, I, I, I think. We forget about how regulated fishing is. But we're trying to look at the science, whether, whether or not, and what levels of that. And I'll, I'll get back to you on, on where the fish and wildlife, we're also pulling yeah. data from the USGS, and we're looking at an enforcement part of it too. Because even though we do things as this country, uh, we don't have a lot of enforcement and, an, and enough physical presence out there to make sure other countries uh, are in compliance. So that has to be taken consideration of any plan. Because as you know, Russia and China are out there not abiding exactly, by the rules. Exactly, leading to my next question. But first, uh, if you mentioned a state visit. Um, the president won in the Northern Marianas in the primary lost in Guam. So just remind him about that. And that is our priority. And we are working <laughs> to get a Mr. state Secretary, visit between the three. Be before, before I... Uh, I'd like to sit down with you again, like we did last year in this room back here when everyone had ran off to vote and it was just you and I, to discuss your thoughts about the plans, the military plans for the Marines, for the island of Tinian and the need for the island of Pog. And Mr. Chairman, are you back on time? Thank you, Mr. Gosar. Thank you. Secretary, thank you so very much. I'm going to cut it short to try to let others speak, but there's too many things that I can say and applaud you for putting your elbow and your shoulder behind. Uh, the first thing I really want to compliment you on is continue this reorganization plan. But you heard from my colleagues on both sides of the aisle that Arizona would be like to be exempt from California. That would be our one little clue. Um, on the critical minerals, absolutely love uh, where you're going with this. Um, just a side note, maybe some of the sidebar, you're a geologist, you understand some of these side metals that are very critical are associated with like copper and with nickel mining. So maybe inclusions of those would be very forthright. Uh, it's going to be our future um, so that we're not uh, dependent upon uh, China for that. Um, you're very aware of the Grand Canyon beefalo. This is a uh, non, uh, uh, this is an invasive non-native species. Um, the Park Service has dragged their feet over and over again. They are destroying a, a critical uh, ecosystem. We'd love to see you. I know you are a co-sponsor of the bill. This is a win-win situation in allowing the Arizona Game and Fish to allow hunting experiences, make some money off of it. So we'd love to see you make some inroads there. Um, Twin Metals um, and the Superior National Forest, thanks for the M opinion. We appreciate that. Any new information on the withdrawals that were uh, uh, actually done by Congress twice? Any new updates on that, sir? Uh, in, in regards to the M opinion, uh, it was a legal analysis 
that when they canceled the preferred leases, it was not on legal standing. Yeah. So we withdrew those, and now they have to go through a NEPA process, as they should. Uh, we're just trying to be fair. And up front, there are places to mine and extract, and there are places not to. That's why we have a NEPA process in our country that should be fair, should be uh, firm, but it also should, be, should not be arbitrary. Um, last but not least, um, your proposed uh, five-year offshore plan was a breath of fresh air. Um, uh, please put forth a final plan that closely resembles what you proposed. Uh, hundreds of uh, members of Congress on both sides applaud you for that. Um, but I just would uh, like to take my last 30 seconds and just say thank you for, for engaging, uh, making it a, a bottom-up instead of a top-down. I think that makes a world of difference for uh, 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 trying to get uh, the West looking uh, like it should. And with that, I'm just going to say thank you. And thank you for your comms, Director. <laughs> Jeez. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. Songus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, welcome, Mr. Zinke. A couple of things. I think I've heard you say you understand well that Massachusetts, as a state, on a bipartisan basis, we have met your test, a letter, uh, with every member of Congress, as well as our Republican governor, signing on in opposition to uh, drilling off our, our beautiful shores. So uh, that's your understanding, is it not? It is clear that Massachusetts stands firmly opposed to offshore, but you should also uh, know that there are really no resources off the coast of Massachusetts, uh, and uh, we can go through one, one science of where they are, but yes, yeah, I, I have you down for a no. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, I want to revisit the issue that Mr. McEachin brought up, which is the issue of sexual assault. Um, you referenced it more broadly across the Department of Interior, but uh, there was a survey done within the National Park Service, and I think it's important to highlight the results of that survey, that 38.7% of survey participants experienced some form of harassment in the past year, 10.4% of participants experienced sexual harassment in the past year, 74.7% of employees who experienced harassment did not file a report or complaint about the behavior. Of those who chose not to re uh, report, 45.9% thought nothing would be done if they filed a report or complaint, and 33% did not trust the process. Uh, your budget does not include any dedicated funding to this issue. Um, in my role in the House Armed Services Committee, we've seen uh, all the services wrestle with this very seriously, as well as the Defense Department more broadly. It does require resources uh, to be effective. You said the budget is a work in progress. Do, can you imagine finding funds to dedicate to this, whatever effort you put in place? Well, the, the, the report, you know, looks back. And I don't give judgment. It was a previous administration. Uh, it is still there. The sexual harassment is still there. I think much of it is leadership. Leadership, but leadership often requires a backup. And, uh, for example, in the DOD, we found nothing really happened until a general was put in charge of the Sexual Assault Prevention Response Office. So somebody with real standing within the organization has to take charge, and I hope that you will consider this as you move forward. Uh, there's also another survey that's been done of part-time employees. When do you expect the results of that to be released? Because I understand that it has been completed. Initially, we expected to hear it um, in spring of this year. I will look on that. But I can tell you what sent shockwaves through Interior is when I fired four. And I've said it again, I will fire 400 if necessary. Like you, I think sexual harassment is a cancer in an organization, and everyone deserves the right to come to work free of harassment, free of intimidation, and have a work environment that promotes integrity, innovation, and a strong work ethic. I agree, but obviously, given the numbers that have been revealed, it's going to take a real culture change, and I appreciate your actions, but I do think something more comprehensive will be required. And within the National Park Service, uh, there's yet to be a permanent director. I imagine a permanent director at the head of that service uh, could begin to wrestle with the culture change that's needed. 
When does the administration plan to nominate a director of the National Park Service, a permanent director? Well, the Office of Government Ethics in the FBI, I just had my, my uh, nominee, the president's nominee, excuse me, for the USGS just came out of the, of the, of the Office of Government Ethics and FBI after about a year. He's an astronaut. He has a PhD in Earth Sciences. He has a now, top we're secret. About the National Park Service. So well, will but there this be a gives you an nominee. This gives you an example. All our slate has been done. I don't have a BLM. I don't have Fish and Wildlife Service. I don't have Park Service. I still don't have USGS. Can, okay. I can go on, and but it's not the White House. Speaking quickly of USGS, you have mentioned a number of times today about the importance of science in your decision making. Uh, and that, and the, the USGS's role in doing that. And yet, uh, you're proposing to restructure the, uh, the climate and land use change program and significantly cut the numbers of dollars that would make their way into the USGS, I think, uh, seriously compromising its role in establishing good science around climate change and other things. And I yield back. Thank you. Um, two things very quickly. First of all, the Secretary has graciously said he will stay here longer. And we had originally planned. Thank you for doing that. So I'm just efforts, having so much fun, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so am I. And so your efforts to cut back, you don't necessarily need to do that. It's not happening anyway, so you don't necessarily need to do that. Second way, I appreciate you having Massachusetts written down as a no on activities in federal waters. Have you got Utah written down as a yes on activities on federal lands in my state? And I hope the other side would recognize that as well. Mr. Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Zinke, great to see you. Appreciate you taking the time to be here. And uh, do want to thank you and uh, Deputy Secretary Bernhardt uh, for your efforts in regards to the Amble Points issue, uh, which was uh, impacting four of our counties with the surplus revenues to which were paid into the AML funds. And uh, do want to note that uh, particularly appreciative of all of your efforts to be able to bring this to uh, some level of conclusion for these counties. It really is important. Thank you for that. I uh, did want to take the opportunity to be able to visit with you on the uh, fiscal 19 budget that was coming out. We have a project in Colorado that's in my district or a portion of my district, uh, the Frying Pan Arkansas project, which was started in 1962. Part of that project uh, was also the Arkansas Valley Conduit to be able to deliver fresh drinking water into southeastern Colorado as a result of the EPA mandates under the Clean Water Act. Uh, Mr. Secretary, our, our communities in southeastern Colorado are literally in a no-win situation, and the concern is that was zeroed out in the budget. Uh, the EPA has required the Clean Water Act to be employed. The resources are not there to be able to build it. This has been going on since 1962, and in fact, if we probably had taken the money that was spent on the studies, we could have built the project during that period of time. But uh, the concern is they have a no win. Uh, simply with uh, the mandate out of the EPA, the resources are not there, zeroing this out in the budget. And can you speak to this issue and what we might be able to expect in Southeast Colorado? Well, it is, and I understand the Water District is looking at different innovations. The challenge we have in, in Bureau of Reclamation is this. The initial idea was for the government to step in, make the investments, and then over the period of time, the water users would pay for it and we would transfer title. It is not transferring title has resulted over time in an enormous amount of infrastructure that we now pay for that we shouldn't. And transferring title, when it's appropriate, will free up money to invest in new projects uh, that the small communities can't afford. That was what the, the fundamental idea about Bureau of Reclamation was all about. So we find ourselves in systems that have long since paid for themselves on when, when, when the initial deal was made, but yet we maintain enormous amount of overhead, maintenance, political uh, battles on it when we should be transferring. That would help the Department of Interior. And we have asked in the budget for a title transfer authority uh, to be given, and, it, and we'll make sure it's appropriate and work with Congress to do it, but there's some projects 
If we transfer it, it will free up money to fund exactly what you're talking about, what the intent of the Bureau of Reclamation should be doing. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Important issue, obviously, for our district. Uh, next issue, and I still want to be respectful of your time and, and my colleagues as well. Uh, we've introduced legislation myself and uh, Cory Gardner uh, on the Senate side uh, to authorize a study by uh, the department to be able to move BLM headquarters to the west. And I appreciate uh, the reorganization plan that you're currently putting together. I'd like to be able to get your ideas on that. I'd be remiss if I did not note that uh, Colorado would obviously be the prime location for you to be able to consider. Uh, but uh, can you give us an update on some of your thoughts on uh, BLM relocation? Where we are, the organization is, is the map you see, we're that far. And quite frankly, there are bureaus that we think are candidates to move up west because the preponderance of, of activity is west. BLM, certainly, uh, Bureau of Reclamation. We haven't decided where we go, but I would think what we would do is we would create a metrics on quality of life, good schools, hospitals, accommodation, those type of things, and target cities within these, these groups for candidates, and, and perhaps even compete the, the, the cities to it. We have 2,600 facilities nationwide, and we're in a lot of towns that people don't think they are, but my concern is making sure we go to a, a community that is high quality of life, that is affordable for the GS5, GS7, great communities that, that people that, that we can compete for our millennials that will want to, want to be there. Colorado certainly you know, fits that description. Thank you, I concur with that. So I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, just following up on uh, uh, Congresswoman Sangas's scientific integrity questions. Should the Department of Interior uh, pursue and publicize peer-reviewed scientific data, even if you yourself or the president disagree with the data? Yes, if you're referring to the, the Petroleum uh, Reserve, National Petroleum Reserve, I don't change a comma. But I can tell you when, when I'm responsible, just like your staff, if your staff releases a document, I think you probably well, look at it before you do. Yeah, but Same thing with mine. It doesn't mean I change it, especially when it's scientific integrity in a study. I don't change a okay. comma, but I do read it before it goes out. Well, in the specific case we're referencing is USGS scientists resigned because uh, he felt he was being demanded to see data before it was made public. Uh, and a demand which uh, violated the agency's fundamental science practices and the feeling was to allow energy companies to trade on this information unfairly, and so... That would be an allegation, sir, that's untrue. So... That's an allegation that's untrue. I would like an apology, Mr. Chairman. Do you ask the scientists who made the allegation? No, that it alleged is something that occurred. I didn't change a, a comma in any, any document, and I never would. But I can tell you I read it. In the, in the case of the National Petroleum Reserve, I want to know why the data was not consistent. Same, same set of data, two reports, only a couple years apart, and yet... Oh, the, so it's, the, you're, you're, in prefacing your intention, then, it's, you know, your intention is not to suppress scientific findings that you might disagree with, or to release a sensitive scientific information in violation of the own rules in the department. I don't change a comma from any scientific report, but I do read it before it goes out because I want to know in this case. It's not about you, changing, it's about disclosure and pre-review and getting it out I think you, I think you should know why, I should know as a boss, why okay. the same data set was different, same study three years apart that grossly underestimated the reserves. Okay. Another question, dealing with issues of transparency and other points that have been brought up as we through this discussion, do you agree that the department should have a permanent inspector general and that the IG should operate independently from your office and that funding for that IG office should be sufficiently increased to in the next budget cycle? The IG is an independent body that, that follows the law. I think their budget is sufficient to carry out their duties. 
And uh, I want to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, at the time I have left, uh, uh, a statement from Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, a statement from American Veterans, AMVETS, uh, a letter from the American Society on Aging, a statement from the Vet Voice Foundation, statement from the National Disability Rights Network, statement for Alliance for Retired Americans, a statement from Social Security Works, all essentially uh, condemning the remarks Secretary Zinke made blaming the elderly, veterans, and people with disabilities uh, for, increasing, uh, for the push to increase fees in our national parks. Now, also, I think it's important for the committee to know that there's a distinction uh, it, with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, the LWCS is a 53-year-old program. These new proposals to, that are, we're talking about today to engage in dangerous new drilling off the beaches of Florida, California, and other states, uh, have their, their separate issues. And Congress authorized $900 million a year on, on paper for LWCF, but that money, of course, is subject to appropriations by Congress. The, in contrast, the administration's proposal and what we've heard from the Secretary the leg and the legislation that is in Congress now incentivizes this new drilling in places where it, is, where it has been deemed inappropriate in the past. New drilling is the only way M MPS backlog gets money. Further, this money would be mandatory spending, so Congress would have no role in deciding how it gets done. This proposal amounts to saying we have to risk destroying some parks or our parks in order to save them. It's also ironic that at a time when you are arguing for new OCS revenue as a way to fix our parks, there is also consideration being by the department to reducing the royalty rate for that same drilling. Uh, I don't know how that will work. And uh, yield back. Perhaps you'll have a chance to answer that rhetorical question sometime. Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Sinke, it's great to have you here this morning. Thank you for all you've done this past year. Uh, last week, I, along with Senator Crapo, sent you a letter regarding grazing management in wilderness areas on BLM land. Specifically, the letter asked you to re-examine BLM Manual 6340 that was finalized during the Obama administration and fails to reflect congressional intent. The record is clear. Congress intended to allow grazing, including increasing the number of AUMs, where appropriate in designated wilderness areas. Since we just sent you the letter last week, I don't expect you to have a complete answer for me today, but will you commit to reviewing this particular manual to ensure it is consistent with congressional intent? Well, as you know, the Wilderness Act of 64 was a grand compromise between three parts. The preservationists, the hunters and fishermen, and the cattlemen. And it's my opinion that we have not lived up to the obligation and the intent of that law, and we're looking at it. it clearly, when you can't do timber harvest, uh, there is a lot of dead and dying timber and undergrowth, which is a fire hazard. And many times in the wilderness, it starts in the wilderness, either by lightning or other means, and it extends outside. So having grazing has always been a positive, in most cases, of uh, removing the, the dead and dying timber and some of the, some of the growth. We are looking at that policy. Grazing also, you have to weigh it with elk and deer because in many wildernesses, it's a competition for, for food and we don't want to make sure we have unintended consequences, but we're looking at it hard and I agree with you, it should be looked at. Thank you. I also want to discuss 68 grazing permits up for renewal in Owyhee County, Idaho. These permits have come to be known as the Owyhee 68. Originally scheduled for renewal in 1997, these permits are still awaiting renewal more than 20 years later due to ongoing litigation. Over the years, BLM has repeatedly capitulated to the demands of environmental groups to the detriment of ranchers who have worked on the land for generations. While grazing permit renewals can be complicated, they should not be this complicated. What are you doing at the Department of Interior to ensure that BLM and the other agencies involved in the renewal of grazing permits have the resources they need to complete the process? I think in this case, my understanding, it's before the administrative judges at the Interior Board of Land Appeals. Um, but I agree with your overall thesis that in what, and it could have been willful and intentional uh, to slow roll these things. Um, and I, I, we've seen that 
uh, across the West. We'll work with you on it, and we'll, we'll show you all the data that, that we have on it. Uh, in coming from Montana, where there's a lot of really good people out there, in, in my experience, uh, ranchers respect the land, and some of the greatest uh, land in this country uh, is in the hands of ranchers. They're good people, they work hard, they preserve the land, and, and in general, uh, if a lot of our land was had ranchers on it, we wouldn't have the issues we do. All right, thank you, and I, for sake of the committee, I'll yield back the rest, the rest of my time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Soto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, first I wanna thank you for publishing the Sandskink relocation permit in the Federal Register uh, this week. Uh, this is an area in Winter Haven in our district that uh, has a new community center in it. Uh, economically depressed areas, so we appreciate that. Uh, the AP reported this week that the manatee population has taken a pretty steep dive because of a cold winter. Uh, as you may know, it got reduced down to threatened. So do we have your commitment to hold the line on at least the threatened status for uh, manatees given the erratic population uh, numbers over the past couple of years due to weather? Yeah, you haven't been committed to, and I'll work with you on it. It's an issue to us. Uh, we're concerned about it. We're looking at the same data that, that you have, and we're trying to expedite, expedite that. Uh, the cold winter has affected a lot of species uh, down in, in the Everglades, uh, and I'm committed to work with you on it to make sure. I think we're on the same page on it. We just want to make sure there's a healthy population, the manatees. As you know, one of my priorities when I became in office is go down to Florida, look at the Everglades and the Everglades, which you're concerned about as well as I am, is that it starts with making sure the plumbing is right. Uh, the Everglades won't be fixed until we get the water flow right, and the water flow affects the entire peninsula, uh, and we're working hard to come up with a plan and, and expedite it. Mr. Secretary, I'm glad you mentioned the Everglades because that's what I was gonna ask about next. Uh, as you know, we've sped up the Herbert Hoover Dyke uh, construction, but there was recently in our state legislature a new reservoir passed on a bipartisan, uh, in a bipartisan manner that requires 50% federal funding of $1.4 billion altogether. It's an eight-year project, 10,500-acre res reservoir and 6,500-acre treatment marsh. Uh, I know Congress obviously makes the final decisions on these funding issues, but can we count on your support uh, for the funding that Congress will need to make sure this new reservoir becomes a reality? You can, and here's an issue that we need to work together on, is the way that new starts are in process with the Army Corps of Engineers, that project should be all one. But it's listed each different component is a new start, so it takes Congress to authorize the, the, a new start, uh, and what happens is, is you, on a project management scale, you, we can't begin uh, and end the certain components unless we fix the structure of it. So that whole project should be one start, and so you can do it as a project management and, and proceed expeditiously. So if we, if what we, if we all work together in this, uh, we can make it more efficient and get it done faster with less cost. So if we got a new star consolidation for the Everglades project out of this committee, that would be something you'd support then? I would. If we, if we put the whole project, these, these projects, as one entity, so you didn't have to go to Congress to authorize each component of it, it would speed the process up exponentially. And, and lastly, with regard to offshore oil drilling, uh, is it fair to say, since there's been some confusion, that Florida is going through the BOEM process um, but that you expect, given your past statements, that will be excluded? Is that fair to say? My commitment is we will do no new oil and gas platforms off the coast of Florida. I can't make it any, any clearer to that. Legally, there's a process that we go through, uh, but my commitment is the same as I made to the governor. And you would have thought that, that all the members of Florida would have went, yes! Uh, but there, were, there was blowback. Somehow it, it was either a political decision, or, but it, it was the right decision in Florida, and I'll stand by it was the right decision in Florida, unless you disagree. Mr. Secretary, we were very pleased by the decision. Uh, I can tell you it was just when the BOEM director stated that we were still in the process that then 
put it into a, a tailspin. Um, that, that was really where we find ourselves today. But yes, we definitely appreciate uh, Florida ultimately being out of it. So, we don't, so no possibility we're going to be ended up in it by the end. My commitment remains steadfast. Thanks, and I yield back the remainder of my time.